Good morning, friends. Chapter 18. March 7th, 1944. Rudy Rosenberg watches as the 3,800 September transport prisoners from the family camp arrive at the quarantine camp, B2A. The news Sh Shemulski has given him is horrifying. Anyone would be deeply depressed by it, but Rudy is searching for one thing among the columns of prisoners, the slender figure of his girlfriend, Alice. Finally, their eyes meet and their smiles of satisfaction rise above the anguish. Once all the prisoners have been assigned to huts, the Nazis allow the inmates to move freely about the camp. In his room, Rudy gets together with Alice and her two resistance friends, Vera and Helena. Helena tells him that most of the prisoners seem to have accepted the official story, that they'll be transferred to a more northerly camp located close to Warsaw. Vera has a shrill voice that makes her emaciated face seem even more bird-like. Some of the important representatives of the camp's Jewish community think that the Germans won't dare exterminate the children because they're scared that the, world, the word would spread. Rosenberg has no alternative but to pass on Shemulski's impressions from this morning, which are grimmer and more to the point than ever. He told me that there wasn't much time left, and he believed they could all die tomorrow. Rudy's words are met with complete silence. The women understand that the head of the resistance knows the facts better than anyone because he has an extensive network of spies throughout Auschwitz. Nervousness gives rise to all sort of rumors, half-rumors, wishes, ideas, fantasies. And if the war were to end tonight? Helena momentarily recovers her cheerfulness. If the war ended tonight and I returned to Prague, the first thing I'd do is go to my mother's house and eat a bowl of goulash the size of a barrel. I'd climb into the saucepan of a loaf of bread and leave it so clean that I could then use it as a mirror to pluck my eyebrows. They start to sniff the aroma of the spicy stew and sigh with happiness, and then they return to reality and the smell of fear. They try to reorder their thoughts again in an attempt, and in an, in an attempt, come up with something positive in such a densely black outlook, some tiny detail they've overlooked that would provide a satisfactory explanation for everything a nail in which they can hang their hopes and their lives. The only additional information Rudy can provide, because as registrar, he's seen the transport list, is that nine people in total from the September transport will be left behind in the family camp. The two sets of twins whom Dr. Mengele has reserved for his experiments, three doctors and a pharmacist who have accompanied the transferees to the quarantine camp, whom Mengele has also claimed, and the mistress of Mr. Willie, the camp capo. All the others will receive the special treatment specified in the Nazi plan laid out when they arrived in September. Rudy's information is, in fact, incorrect. There are more people on the not-to-be-transferred list, but things are too confusing at this stage, although all will be revealed in due course. After an hour of exhaustive reflection that leads nowhere, they're so weary they fall silent. Vera and Helena leave, and Rudy and Alice find themselves alone. For the first time, no barbed wire comes between them. No guards and towers with guns at their shoulders watch them, and no chimneys remind them of the degradation that surrounds them. They look at each other for a moment, shyly, and with some awkwardness at first, and then more and more intensely. They're young and they're beautiful, full of life and plans and desires, and an urgency to drink their fill of the present moment. And as they gaze again at each other with a spark of desire well alight in their eyes, they feel that their happiness insulates them that it takes them to another place, and that nothing can snatch this moment from them. For the time this dream lasts, as he hugs Alice's body, Rudy believes that his happiness is so complete, nothing can destroy it. He falls asleep thinking that when he wakes up, all evil will have been erased and that life will flow again as it did before the war. Roosters will crow at dawn, and there'll be a smell of freshly baked bread and the sound of the milkman's cheerful bicycle bell. But the next day dawns and nothing has been erased. Birkenau's menacing landscape remains intact. He's still too young to know that happiness cannot conquer anything. It's too fragile. Rudy is woken abruptly by an agitated voice, and it feels as if a window inside his head has exploded into a million pieces. It's Helena, and she's extremely worried. She tells him Shmulski is looking for him urgently, and the whole camp is overrun with SS soldiers, and something really serious is about to happen. Rudy tries to put on his boots as Helena, almost hysterical, tugs at his arm and practically drags him from his bed, while Alice dozes in, on between the sheets, desperately clinging a little longer to her dreams. For God's sake, Rudy, hurry up! There's no time! There's no time! As soon as Rudy steps outside, he too senses something's not right. 
There are a lot of SS guards. He's never seen so many before, which suggests they've asked for special reinforcements from other detachments. It doesn't look like the routine procedure for escorting a contingent of prisoners to a train for a regular transfer. He's got to see Shemolsky right away. There's no question that he'd prefer not to see him, not to listen to what he has to say, but he must go and meet him in Camp B2D. Given his rank, he has no difficulty in, difficulty in exiting the quarantine camp on the pretext that he has to pick up some bread rations that are missing. The resistance leader's face isn't a face anymore. It's a confusion of wrinkles and bags under his eyes. He doesn't beat around the bush anymore. His words aren't discreet or cautious anymore. They're razor sharp. The people transferred from the family camp die today, he says with no hesitation. You mean there'll be a selection? You mean they want to get rid of the old people, the sick, and the children? No, Rudy, everybody. The young Jewish male prisoners forced to help with the disposal of gas chamber victims have received orders to prepare the ovens tonight for 4,000 people. And almost without pausing, he adds, there's no time for regret, Rudy. It's, t it's time to rebel. Shemulski is under a great deal of strain, but his words are absolutely precise, perhaps because he's rehearsed and repeated them dozens of times throughout his long night of insomnia. If the Czechs organize an uprising, if they force a confrontation and fight, they won't be on their own. Hundreds or maybe thousands of us will be beside them, and with a bit of luck, this could work out well. Go and talk to them. Tell them they have nothing to lose. They fight or they die. There's no op There's no other option. But they haven't got a chance in hell without someone to lead them. And in response to Ludi Rudy's look of incomprehension, Shemulski points out that there are at least half a dozen distinct political organizations in the camp. Communist, socialist, Zionist, anti-Zionist, social democrats, Czech nationalist. If one of these groups takes the initi initiative, it's likely to create discussions, differences of opinion, and confrontations with the others which would make it impossible to achieve a united uprising. That's why we need someone whom the majority respects, someone with a great deal of courage who won't hesitate, who will speak out, and whom the rest of them are prepared to follow. But who could that be? Rudy asks incredulously. Hirsch. The registrar slowly nods in agreement, conscious that events have assumed an enormous significance. You have to speak to him, inform him of the situation, and convince him to lead the uprising. Time is running out, Rudy. There's a lot at stake. Hirsch has to rebel and take everyone with him. Uprising. An exciting, magnificent word, worthy of history books. A word that nevertheless falters when Rudy's, when Rudy raises his eyes and looks around. Men, women, and children dressed in rags, unarmed and starving, confronting machine guns mounted in towers, trained dogs, armored vehicles. Shemulski knows that. He knows that many, if not all of them, will die. But a breach might be opened in a few of them. Dozens, maybe or hundreds, might escape into the forest and get away. Maybe the rebellion will take off, and they'll blow up vital camp installations. In that way, they might be able to disable the machine of death, even if only momentarily, and save many lives. Or it might achieve nothing more than people being mowed down by rounds of machine gun fire. There are many unknowns lined up against the certainty of the overwhelming power of the SS. But Shemulski keeps repeating the same thing again and again. Tell him, Rudy. Tell him he's got nothing to lose. Rudy Rosenberg entertains no doubts as he returns to the quarantine camp. Their death sentence is sealed, but they can fight for their destiny. Freddie Hirsch holds the key around his neck, that silver whistle. One blast to announce the unanimous, violent uprising of almost 4,000 souls. As he's walking, he thinks of Alice. So far, he's acted as if Alice weren't part of the September contingent condemned to death, as if none of this had anything to do with her. She is one of the condemned. But Rudy keeps telling himself that she isn't, that it's not possible that Alice's youth and beauty, her body full of delights and her doe-like eyes, could turn into inert flesh in a few hours' time. It is impossible, he tells himself. It's against all the laws of nature. How could someone want to see a young woman like Alice die? Rudy quickens his pace and clenches his fists, overcome by a rage that is turning his despondency into fury. He arrives back at the camp, his cheeks burning with anger. Helena is nervously waiting for him at the camp entrance. Tell Freddie Hirsch to come to my room for an urgent meeting, he says to her. Tell him it's a matter of the utmost importance. It's all or nothing. Helena is back in a flash, accompanied by Hirsch, the idol of the young people, the apostle of Zionism the man who's capable of speaking as an equal with Joseph Mengele. Rudy looks him over quickly, sinewy, his wet hair impeccably combed back, 
a serene, set, slightly severe gaze as if he is irritated at being roused from his thoughts. When Rudy explains that the leader of the resistance of Birkenau has gathered definitive proof that the September transport from Terezin is going to be exterminated in its entirety in the gas ovens that very night, Hirsch's expression doesn't change. There's no surprise, no response. He remains silent, almost standing at attention like a soldier. Rudy fixes his eyes on the whistle hanging from Freddy's neck like an amulet. You are our only chance, Freddy. Only you can speak to the leaders in the camp and convince them to stir up their followers, to launch themselves as one against the guards and start an uprising. You have to talk to all the leaders, and that whistle around your neck has to give the signal that the uprising has begun. Still no response from the German. His expression is impenetrable, and his eyes are fixed on the Slavic registrar. Rudy has already said all he has to say and falls silent, too, as he waits for Hirsch's reaction to the desperate proposal in the midst of a totally hopeless situation. And Hirsch finally speaks. But the person who is speaking isn't a social leader, or the intransigent Zionist, or the proud athlete. Rather, it's the children's educator, and he speaks in a murmur. What about the children, Rudy? Rosenberg would have preferred to leave this discussion until later. The children are the weakest link in the chain. In a violent uprising, they're the ones with the best chances of surviving. But Rudy, with the least chances of surviving. But Rudy has an answer for this, too. Freddy, the children are going to die no matter what. No question. We have a possibility, maybe just a small one, but a possibility, nevertheless, of getting thousands of prisoners to rise up and destroy the camp thereby saving the lives of many deportees who will no longer be sent here. Freddy's lips remain tightly sealed, but as I speak for him, in an uprising involving hand-to-hand -hand combat, the children will be the first ones they slaughter. If a breach is opened in the fence and there's a stampede to escape, they'll be the last ones to fight their way through. If the prisoners have to run hundreds of meters cross-country under a hail of bullets to reach the forest, the children will be the last to get there and the first to be cut down. And if any of them reach the forest, what will they do alone and disoriented? They trust me, Rudy. How can I abandon them now? How can I fight to save myself and leave them to be killed? What if they? What if you are mistaken and there is a transfer to another camp? There won't be. You're doomed. You can't save the children, Freddy. Think about the others. Think about the thousands of children all over Europe and all the children who come to Auschwitz to die if we don't rebel now. Freddy Hirsch closes his eyes and lifts one of his hands to his forehead as if he had a fever. Give me an hour. I need an hour to think about it. Freddy leaves the room with his customary upright posture. No one who sees him walking across the camp could know that he is carrying the unbearable weight of four thousand lives on his shoulders. As he walks, he strokes his whistle obsessively. Several members of the resistance who are already aware of the situation come into Rudy's room to find out what's happened, and Rosenberg tells them that the outcome of his conversation with the tells them the outcome of his conversation with the head of Block 31. He's asked for a while to think it over. One of them, a check with a steely look, says Hirsch is buying time. They all look at him, asking him to explain what he means. They're not going to destroy him. He's useful to the Nazis. He's prepared valuable, valuable reports for them, and anyway, he's German. Hirsch is waiting for Mengele, Mengele to claim him, to remove him from, to remove him from here any moment. That's what he's waiting for. A tense silence hangs briefly in the air. That's a low comment. That's a low. Sorry. That's a low comment typical of communists like you. Freddy has taken risks for the sake of the children hundreds of times more often than you. Renata Bubinik yells at him. The Czech starts to shout too, calling her a stupid Zionist and saying that they've heard Hirsch asking the capo in his current hut if there's been any message for him. Rudy stands up and tries to make peace. He now realizes why it's so important to find a leader. A single voice, someone capable of bringing such a mixed group of people together and convincing them to rise up as one. When everyone else leaves, Alice comes to sit beside Rudy and share the weight, because that's all they can do now. Wait for Hirsch's reply. Alice's presence is a relief in the midst of chaos and uncertainty. She finds it hard to believe that the Nazis will kill all of them, even the children. Death is something terrible but foreign to her, as though it could happen to others but not to her. Rudy tells her it's horrible, but Shemuski can't be wrong about something like this. Then he asks her to change the topic. They talk about life after Auschwitz, about how much she likes country houses, about her favorite foods, the name she'd like to give her children one day, about real life, not this nightmare in which they are trapped. For a short while, a future seems possible. 
The minutes pass, and the weight of tension is almost unbearable. Rudy thinks about Hirsch's burden. Alice is talking to him, but he's no longer listening. There's a stifling heaviness in the air. There's a clock inside his head with an infernal tick-tock that's driving him mad. An hour goes by, and there's no news from Hirsch. Minutes pass. Another hour. No sign from Hirsch. Alice fell silent some time ago, and her head is resting in Rudy's lap. Rudy starts to become aware that death is very near. Meanwhile, in the family camp next door, classes have been suspended in Block 31. The teachers from the December transport, who are now in charge of the school, are too concerned. Some try to organize games for the children, but the children themselves are restless. They want to know where their classmates are going, and they aren't at all interested in guessing games or songs. It's an afternoon of lethargy and tense calmness. There's no fuel for the fire, and it's colder than ever. One of the assistants arrives and tells everyone that new capos have been named to replace the Jewish barracks heads of the September transport. Dita sticks her head outside every now and again to see what's happening in Camp B2A, where half her former companions are now located. She can see people walking along the main street in the quarantine camp. Some even walk up to the fence, but security is tight and the soldiers immediately move them on. The atmosphere is so charged that Tita thinks it would be foolish to move the books, which remain carefully hidden in what was until yesterday Hirsch's den and is now occupied in Lichenstern. The new head has exchanged his meal ration for half a dozen cigarettes. He smoked them one after another and continues to pace up and down the hut like a caged lion. Everyone is concerned about what's going to happen to the September transport people. Out of solidarity and compassion, no doubt, out of solidarity and compassion, no doubt, but also because whatever happens to those people might be a preview of what lies in wait for them three months from now, when their six months in the camp are over. Have a good day, friends.